Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for another lesson. This time we're doing matrix methods. We have a project involving optics. So I'm going to do optics with matrices because it's different. So, and why matrices? Well, matrices are a very powerful tool that we can use to solve all kinds of interesting problems. But, uh, and you're going to discover lots of those in your career. But uh, this week we're going to apply them to a particular domain that uh, is a little bit novel. We're going to get some practice with how matrices work and how we use them in Python and how to do calculations. Um, I think that adding a new context deepens your understanding. So anytime you take an old tool that you're familiar with and apply it to a new situation, you understand it a little bit more. And even if it's a new tool, applying it to a new situation, you're going to understand it more than you would have otherwise. And finally, it's, uh, it's just fun. I, I know you're going to use matrices most of the time in your life as a technique for solving n equations and n unknowns. That is a very important problem domain. Um, but uh, matrices are much richer than that. The whole field of linear algebra is much richer than that. And so I didn't want to do that. We're probably going to end up doing it sooner or later in this course anyway, but I didn't want to do it as the thing we did with matrices, so we're doing something different. So that's why. So let's see what it's about. First of all, uh, I want to imagine you have some kind of optical system with lenses and other stuff, and there are rays of light that uh, go through the system. We're, we're going to be doing what's called geometrical optics, so we're basically just following a ray of light as it goes from one part of the system to another. And at any point, a ray, <coughs> a ray is going to be represented as a two-element object. I'm going to call it a vector because uh, I'm thinking of a vector in a vector space. Um, and the vector is represented mathematically as an object that looks like a vertical bar and a right angle bracket. Um, it's called a ket. And that's just nomenclature. It's just terminology. Don't don't get freaked out about it, but uh, basically it's just a way to talk mathematically about a vector. And in this case, a vector represents a ray of light. And at one, at one point along the x-axis, at, at any given point, a single ray of light has a height above the x-axis and an angle that it makes relative to the x-axis. So the y value is the height, the alpha value is the angle. Um, we're going to call that a ray. And uh, and that's what it that's what it's about. So as the ray goes along, however, it doesn't stay at the same height and the same angle. If you move through uh, a space that has a constant index of refraction, the ray goes in a straight line, and so uh, its angle doesn't change, but its height does. And as you go from one medium to another, your index of refraction changes, and as you tr transition from one medium to another the height doesn't change because you're not going anywhere you're just moving from one side of an interface to the other side of an interface but the angle does so it turns out light always takes a path between any two points that takes the least time and if uh, you follow that through to its logical conclusion you'll find that there's a relationship between the angle on one side of an interface and the angle on the other side of the interface and we're going to work that out but um, the other restriction I'm going to make in order to make this thing uh, work out nicely, we're going to assume the angles are all small. I'm going to assume the heights are all small compared to the radius of curvature of the optics that we have, and I'm going to assume the angles are all small angles, so I can use the small angle approximation essentially. So if you think of these vectors as elements of a space with a height dimension and an angle dimension, so you can think of it literally as a vector that points in this abstract vector space. The vectors we're going to be dealing with all lie close to the origin. <clears throat> they have small values of height and small values of angle. Small values of height compared to the radius of curvature of the optic, small values of angle compared to 1. Now one of the things I'm going to have to do to work out the matrices and stuff is to inv in import the idea of unit vectors, like a unit vector that points in the height direction would be a a ray with a height of 1 and an angle of 0, and a unit vector that points in the angle direction would be a unit vector with an angle of 1 and a height of 0. 
Now the thing is, we're using un radian units for angle, so an angle of 1 is not a small angle. So even though we're going to be using an angle of 1 in the derivations, understand that the real angles we end up with when we do calculations are all going to be very small compared to 1. We'll see how that comes out. So let's, uh, let's look at translation. So the idea is um, we need to come up with some kind of a, an effect of translation. So the effects of these changes that occur are going to be treated as operators that act on these vectors. So an operator transforms one vector into a new vector. And we represent it <coughs> mathematically as a matrix. So that's where the magic comes in. Now we'll, we'll talk later in the semester, I'll get in a little bit about what linear algebra is. Some of you have had linear algebra so you know all this stuff. But um, basically as long as you have uh, operators that obey the property that if you have an operator acting on a superposition of two vectors it's the same thing as the sum of the results of the operator acting on one vector and the operator acting on another vector then you have what's called a linear vector space and you have a linear operator so in our case what it means is as long as we can treat rays as having a as being something like the superposition of a ray with height but no angle and a ray with angle but no height and as long as the effect of all our transitions is such that if you take the effect of having a ray with the same height but no angle and add that to the effect you get by having a ray with an angle but no height, um, as long as you can add those together and get the same result as a ray with a height and an angle, then you're doing linear algebra. And we can represent all, we can represent all these transitions that occur as the ray goes along as matrices. So why that works and so on will take us beyond what we can do in this class, but let's just assume that it does work and see how it works, see how it turns out. So if you want to invent a, a matrix that does that, there's a very simple rule for figuring out what it is. You basically think of the possible things that can happen as being basis vectors. Uh, a basis vector is, for example, the first vector there is the ray 1, 0, which is a ray that has a height but no angle. The second basis vector is a ray that has no height but an angle. And, and the first column of an operator is simply whatever the operator does to the first ray, the first basis vector, and the second column is whatever the operator does to the second basis vector. And then any, if you can think of any vector as a superposition of the first basis vector and the second basis vector, then some combination, a little bit of the first and a little bit of the second, then uh, the matrix will do the right thing. It will calculate the effect of that of that operator. So the idea is these two guys are basis vectors, and all we need to do is figure out what does the trans what is the translation going from one place to the other in the system? What does it do to these basis vectors? That's the question. So let's see. If we have a basis vector that corresponds to a height and no angle, and we simply translate that ray, what it, what happens? Uh, nothing happens. Basically, it just comes out again, the same height and still no angle. So that's easy. The first column of the translation operator is 1, 0. What about if there is an angle but no height? In this case, you can see the height changes, but the angle stays the same. So how much does the height change by? Well, it changes by the angle times the distance that it goes. In our case, and that, that is valid for small angles, we're going to apply it to the case where we have an angle of 1, a unit angle, and of course it's, it's not technically valid at that point, but it doesn't matter because the only angles we really are going to deal with are small angles. So what it boils down to is it comes out with the height L1. So that means we can write down our trans translation operator as 1, 0, L1, just like that. The first column tells what happens to the ray with height and no angle. The second column tells what happens to the ray with angle and no height. And that's the end of the story. Let's see how that works in practice. So suppose we come in with a ray that has height and angle. Um, <clears throat> we can see what's going to happen. If you look at a little bit later, the height's going to go up by a distance alpha L. The angle's going to stay the same. Let's see what happens if we apply our translation operator to such a ray. Notice that when you do matrix multiplication, the height becomes y0 plus alpha L, and the angle becomes 0 plus alpha. In other words, it just stays alpha. So 
it does exactly the right thing. The translation operator does exactly what it ought to do. Um, the incoming ray gets translated in height and the angle stays the same. Let's look at refraction. So refraction is a case where you have a curved surface with two different indices of refraction on either side and you want to know what happens to an arbitrary ray when it goes through. We need to come up with an operator, a matrix, that does that. So the first column of such an operator is what you get when you send a ray in that has a height and no angle. I've drawn such a ray here. Let's see if we can figure out what happens. <coughs> first of all, you can see the height doesn't change. When you go from one side of the interface to the other, the height stays the same. That's easy. So um, we know what happens to the height, but what happens to the angle? To do that, we need to use uh, Snell's law. Now, you've probably learned Snell's law at some point in your life. It's n sine n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. We're going to use the small angle approximation in which the sine of theta is approximately theta. And so what we get is the index on the left times the angle on the left is the index on the right times the angle on the right. That's the idea. Now let's draw in a ray that goes through the center of curvature. And you can see that the angle that the incoming ray makes with the normal is we're going to label that theta sub L. That's the angle on the left. Notice it's the same as the angle that the uh, ray that goes through the center of curvature makes with the axis. Okay. Now what about the angle that the outgoing ray makes with the perpendicular or the normal? That's this angle. That's theta r, angle on the right. And uh, it's related to the angle on the left by Snell's law. So if you know the angle on the left, you can work out the angle on the right by Snell's law. But the, new, the point is now the ray makes an angle relative to the axis. Now that angle we've been calling alpha. And if you draw the line here that goes along the horizontal, you can see that alpha is nothing other than the difference between the angle on the left and the angle on the right, except if the angle on the right is smaller than the angle on the left, alpha is negative. If the angle on the right is bigger than the angle on the left, alpha will be positive. So you can see it's minus the difference between the angle on the left and the angle on the right. If you put in Snell's law and throw that all together, you get that the angle on the right is the difference in the indexes divided by the radius of curvature times the index on the right. Now the radius of curvature comes out because um, <clears throat> now let's see. Oh, and re remember that we had a height of 1 coming in. So the angle is 1 divided by r. That's the idea. That's the one thing you have to put in there is that the, uh, the angle, the theta on the left, is 1 over r. If you look at the picture, the way it turns out. Okay, so that's how that goes. Now let's uh, let's look at the second column. What happens if you have a ray coming in with no height? Uh, then it turns out you can just apply Snell's law directly. You have an angle of 1. The, so it's NL times 1 equals NR times alpha. alpha uh, the angle on the right is nothing other than alpha. So alpha has to be nothing other than the ratio of the two indices of refraction if you have an incoming angle of 1. And remember, we're never going to ever have an angle that big, but that's the idea. Okay, so let's see what happens in general. Um, you put in those two columns that we calculated, and if you want to calculate the ray that comes out, you simply multiply the uh, matrix by the incoming ray, and you can see what you get is that the final angle, the final height is equal to the initial height because of the horizontal 1, 0. And the final angle is this complicated expression. The important thing is it's proportional to the original height and it's proportional to the original angle. So you can see that it reduces to, if you put in y0 is 1 and alpha 0 is 0, you get the right answer. And if you put in y0 is 0 and alpha 0 is 1, you get the right answer. So this uh, must be what you get. And uh, it's all in, uh, embedded in that refraction matrix. Okay, let's do an example. <clears throat> so we have a thin lens, we have a ray coming in with the height h. Um, it translates over to the one surface of the lens, so we have a translation operator. Then it gets inside the lens, we have a refraction operator. It translates through the lens, that's another translation operator. Then it refracts at that second surface, that's a refraction operator. And then it translates down to the axis, and that's the final translation operator. The focal length of a thin lens is defined as the distance between the lens and the point where a parallel ray, a ray parallel to the axis, uh, 
coming in crosses the axis on the other side. So that F there is the focal length of the lens. So, but what I want to point out is this thing, the ray is propagating left to right, but when you multiply these operators, you're going to multiply them right to left. So you've got the incoming ray, you apply the translation operator, then the refraction operator, then the second translation operator, then the second refraction operator, <coughs> then the third translation operator. So you end up multiplying these matrices, it looks like you're multiplying them backwards, but remember the first matrix that gets applied is T1, then R run, then T2, and so on. So you end up with um, an overall matrix, which is the matrix of the whole system. In other words, the, so the beautiful thing is, you can multiply all those matrices together, and you get a single matrix which, which represents the effect of the entire system on the ray. So all those intermediate rays you don't actually have to calculate. Let's go through that as a concrete example. Suppose we come in with the ray that's horizontal to the axis at a height h, and we apply the first translation operator. The translation operator, of course, is 1L01. Uh, you multiply that by the incoming ray, and what do you get? You get h0. So that's pretty straightforward. It doesn't do anything. The next ray, uh, you get by refracting at that first interface. So we put in the values for the first interface. Now NL is 1 in this case, NR is the index of the glass. So we have N air and N glass, and if we, uh, if we calculate all that, we get a new ray that still has the same height h, but now it has an angle. It's going down into the glass. All right? So we start with that ray, and then we translate through the glass. Now, the thickness of the lens I'm going to assume is small. So if you multiply that out, you get this complicated looking expression. But I want, what I want to point out uh, is that the H factors out and that inside there you've got T over R. Well, if the lens is very thin, T over R is very small compared to 1. And so we can neglect that term and just may make that just H. In other words, we neglect the small amount the ray comes down inside the lens and uh, it won't matter. The angle, of course, stays the same uh, as it translates through the lens. So then we go from inside the lens to outside the lens. That's a second refraction. Calculate the refraction matrix. You multiply that out. It turns out now you're going from glass to air. So NL over NR is now N instead of 1 over N. And when you multiply that out, you get the result that uh, you still got a height h, but now you have a different angle. The angle is now um, less steep by a factor of n. And then all we do is translate that out to the axis. So the last translation is through a distance f. And notice that the, uh, the final ray we know ends up with the height of 0. So I can put in the height of 0 for the final ray. And now the only unknown in this equation, well, I, I've got an unknown h and an unknown f, but if I multiply that out, notice the h factors out. So this is the magic of a thin lens. The distance you have to go to get to the point where the ray crosses the axis doesn't depend on the height of the initial ray. So that means that that focal length is the same for all parallel rays, which means if you send a bunch of rays in, you get the light to all come to the same focal point. And you can solve for the focal point. It turns out it's just R over N minus 1. So that's the answer. N for glass is like 1.5. So you can see that uh, you're going to get about, uh, see 1.5 is 3 halves, so you get about 2 thirds of R is what the uh, focal length turns out to be. All right, so let's look at a demo of how this works in Python. Okay guys, real quick, I just want to show you how you do matrices in Python. This is the document I posted to ACE. Um, first of all, I just define the index of refraction of air and glass. I start with a ray that's a centimeter above the axis, and I have a radius of curvature of my lens that's uh, 15 centimeters. And the idea is I create a ray as a <coughs> RAY is a optical ray, which is an array, an array of length 2. Actually, it's a 2 by, I'm sorry, it's a 1 by 2. It's one column, two rows. Um, so I guess it's a 2 by 1. They usually say row than column. So um, it's a one column thing. 
dag on it. And uh, the way you spell that in Python is you make a list of lists. The first list is the first row. The second list is the second row. Each row only has one element. <coughs> and so uh, that's how it looks when you print it out. The, the translation matrix for going uh, three centimeters to the, or I'm sorry, three meters to the right, it won't make any difference. This could be anything because the ray is horizontal, so it doesn't matter how far you go, it's still horizontal. So nothing happens if you dot the first translation matrix into the original ray because the translation doesn't do anything to a horizontal ray. Then uh, here is the refraction at the first surface. I put in the values uh, for the matrix and I get uh, an array that looks like a matrix and we call the dot method so you noticed it up here too when you multiply a matrix by a vector you use the dot method you can also use it for a vector dotted into a vector but a matrix dotted into a vector does matrix multiplication and here we have the resulting ray was called ray 2 I come down here and I apply the R1 operator to the ray 2 ray and I get ray 3. So here's the ray after it comes through that first curved surface. I neglect the change in altitude or the change in height due to the translation through the thin lens. It's a very thin lens, so we ignore that. And then <coughs> we don't even need to know the thickness of the lens as long as it's thin enough. Then we apply the second refraction, which has a zero in the lower left-hand corner because it's a planar. The, the, uh, that side of the lens is a plane, which means that it has a, a curvature, a radius of curvature of infinity. I don't think I said that in the other slides, but it's true. So you get a zero there, and then we just get a non-zero in the lower right-hand corner, which is the ratio of the indices. And notice this time we're going from air to glass, or from glass to air. Up here we were going from air to glass, so it's air over glass. Here it's glass over air because we're going from glass to air. And we multiply that out and we get the final ray leaving the lens. Notice it's got a height of one centimeter still, but now it's going down with a slope <coughs> of negative 0.0333. If we divide the height by the slope, we get how far it goes. Basically, we take the rise over the slope and we get the run and that tells us how far we go to hit the axis that's the focal length and it comes out to be 0.3 if we calculate that theoretically we get 0.3 so it's the same answer uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is you can calculate the system matrix by taking the first translation times the first refraction and then multiply the first refraction by that and we get the overall matrix of the system we could just apply the system matrix to ray 1 the incoming ray and we get the same answer so it doesn't matter if you multiply the operators one by one or if you multiply them all together and treat that as a whole system uh, you get the same result so the project you're going to do this week is to it's basically a similar kind of situation but we're going to get a real lens in the laboratory we're going to send the laser beam through the lens and measure its focal length. We'll also calculate its focal length theoretically using this matrix multiplication technique and compare the two. So it's actually quite an easy one this time. You shouldn't have any trouble. We'll see you guys next time.